This is part two of a biblical theology of sleep. Part two of a biblical theology of sleep. I have been so blessed to hear from so many of you that your sleep has been different. Your thinking about sleep has been affected uh, just by what we talked about last week. And thankfully, that was primarily just one point of the outline. And today, we will only be on point two. We will not get to point three or four today. It's going to be entirely point two of the outline. So at least you know where to stay in your note keeping. And last week, we learned that sleep is a nightly reminder that God is God and that we are creatures. God does not sleep and we must. If you remember, we looked specifically at Isaiah chapter 40 and then Psalm 121 verse 3, that he who keeps you will not slumber. And we use those things to guide our thinking about sleep. We remember that every single creature requires sleep. God designed us this way. This was not a design flaw, design constraint, but it was the way that God designed us in his wisdom. He does not give us 24 hours in a day to go about our business, but rather he designed us to function best with an average of 16 hours of awareness and eight hours of sleep, 24 hours to glorify him, but eight of those hours in sleep. The exact amount of sleep that we need at different stages of our life will vary. And, but we learned that bad things start to happen to us physically, mentally, and emotionally when we do not sleep. There is no living creature that we know of that doesn't sleep. God alone is unique in his incomparable attributes. One of those being that he who keeps you will not slumber nor sleep. If you remember Piper's words that I read, sleep is a daily reminder from God that we are not God. Sleep is a parable that God is God and we are men. Sleep is like a broken record that comes around with the same message every day. Do you remember what that message was? Man is not sovereign Man is not sovereign. Man is not sovereign. God alone is sovereign. It's the daily, sweet, necessary reminder that sleep gives us every night. So that was point one. Sleep is a reminder that we are creatures. And then we began point two, that sleep is an opportunity to humbly and dependently trust God. Sleep each night should be a small but very real act of faith. We consider Jesus asleep in a boat in a storm, completely resting upon God and his rule. Sleep is often the exact opposite of anxiety, the ultimate recognition and casting of our anxieties on a mighty God who sustains you and me while we sleep. And then if you remember, we ended last week considering David's amazing testimony in Psalm 4, verse 8, where in the midst of turmoil, he could write, in peace, I will both lie down and sleep. For you alone, O Yahweh, make me dwell in safety. So now we're going to continue our consideration of point two by turning back a chapter from Psalm 4 to Psalm 3. So open your Bible to Psalm chapter 3, as we consider the point that sleep is an opportunity to humbly, independently trust God. But since we're going to have God's word open on our laps throughout today, let's pray together as you turn to Psalm 3. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for disclosing yourself in your word, and I pray that a better understanding of who you are and how that should interact with our daily lives, what we do while we're conscious, and how we go about being unconscious. I pray that your word would have an effect. I pray that I would rightly handle your word 
and that you would give my hearers hearts to hear, ears to hear, prepare their hearts to be affected. I pray that when you are shown for who you are in your word, that we would worship you and we would not be able to go away from the reading of and the understanding of your word unaffected. God, guard and guide my words today. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so Psalm 3. We don't have to guess at the context of this psalm. It says it. It's given to us in the heading. A psalm of David when he fled Absalom. Do you remember this story? My family just finished reading it together as we're working our way through the Old Testament. And when you realize that that is the context of this psalm, it's a truly amazing one. So helpful for us as we consider sleep. So David's family was sort of a mess. If you think, of, if you, think you have family troubles, a hard time at work, or things to be stressed about, consider the circumstance David found himself in as he writes this, fleeing from his son, Absalom. His son, Amnon, had raped his half-sister, Tamar. Then, David's son, Tamar's brother, Absalom, in revenge, killed Amnon, and then was exiled, fled Jerusalem for three years. After returning from exile, then Absalom conspired to get the the nation of Israel to turn against David, dethroning David and making Absalom king in his stead. And so then we read in 2 Samuel 15, 13, that David had to quickly flee Jerusalem. God's word says, a messenger came to David saying, the hearts of the men of Israel have gone after Absalom. Then David said to all his servants who were with him at Jerusalem, arise and let us flee or else there will be no escape for us from Absalom. David was on the run for his life not just from any enemy. He'd been on, on the run many times in his life, but this time he was on the, ru- on the run from his son. And while he ran, he left Jerusalem, it says, weeping as he went. You read in 2 Samuel 16, David was publicly cursed at, had stones hurled at him, And as his son entered Jerusalem, he did all that he could do to publicly humiliate his father. Absalom went out with his armies in pursuit of his father David in order to kill him. So David fled even further, all the way across the Jordan River, and the nation was plunged into civil war. Death was all around. David's closest Friends had turned against him. His son wanted him dead. David's life was in very real danger. And in the midst of this turmoil, we read Psalm 4. As you read along, imagine the struggle and jumble of emotions that David would feel. This isn't just a story. This was, this is the words of the king of Israel, the man after God's own heart, as he wrestles with the reality of the circumstance that he finds him in. Psalm 3. O Yahweh, how many are my foes? Many are rising against me. Many are saying of my soul, there is no salvation for him in God. David starts his prayer telling God what he feels. His situation is dangerous, dire, hard, but he quickly shepherds his heart from a focus on his circumstances to look at his sovereign God, his only hope and the one in whom he trusted in those circumstances. Instead of dwelling on what he feels, he declares to his own heart in prayer what was ultimately real. The situation was hard, but Yahweh God, the keeper of Israel who never sleeps nor slumbers, is with David, so he prayed, verse 3. But you, O Lord, are a shield about me, my glory, the lifter of my head. 
David knew that despite the physically dangerous and emotionally tumultuous circumstances, nothing could get to David without going through God first. That didn't mean that David knew for sure the outcome. He did not know that the one to whom he was praying, or, but he did know that the one to whom he was praying, the one in whom he trusted, was his shield, his glory. Survival through the night was going to be from the same source this night as it had been for every night of his life. And if in the morning he was going to be alive, to lift his head, that would ultimately be from God. So he calls God the lifter of his head. This is so helpful to us. Eyes off the circumstances, eyes onto God. Boyce writes, commenting on this passage, when a believer gazes too long at his enemies, the force arrayed against him seems to grow in size until it appears to be overwhelming. But when he turns his thoughts to God, God is seen in his true, great stature. And the enemies shrink to manageable proportions. Even if they're totally impossible for us to handle on our own. So with his eyes on God, David could say and mean verse 6. And we can say and mean verse 6 if we found ourselves in similar circumstances. I will not be afraid of many thousands of people who have set themselves against me all around. Why? Because God was his shield. Nothing could get to him without going through God first. So verse 5, in those circumstances, David amazingly reports, I lay down and slept. While there were armies hunting him, while he was running for his life, in the dark of night, David lay down and slept. And then in the morning, he awoke again. Why did he awake not on his own power, even though he, he did have armies with him. No doubt they were keeping watch. That wasn't why he woke up. It wasn't because he found the best hiding place, the best strategy, or one of his advisors had infiltrated Absalom's inner, inner sanctum and actually given him bad advice. Those were all means, perhaps, of God keeping him. But David awakes and gives glory to the ultimate cause, the cause behind the causes for why he woke up. For Yahweh sustained me. Yahweh was his glory. Yahweh was the lifter of his head. The only reason David survived that night and woke again is the exact same reason you and I survived last night and woke up. We woke up to take breaths that we don't deserve today. We survived unknown dangers that only God knew that he kept us from. We didn't develop clots in our legs that went to our lungs. Our arteries didn't rupture. We kept breathing. Who knows what else God kept you from? The amazing thing is, whether you or I are in mortal danger on a battlefield, in a life-threatening situation in a hospital bed, or in the illusion of safety that we often experience and are deceived by in our suburban homes, when we awake in the morning, David's prayer ought to be our prayer. I lay down and slept, and I woke again, for you, O oh God, sustained me. This is why I say sleep is an opportunity to humbly, dependently trust God. Don't miss that opportunity. I recently spoke to a brother who had a hard time sleeping due to his time in the military, PTSD symptoms that often keep him awake at night. I know many of you struggle with anxieties, 
Maybe there's very real things that you worry about, very real dangers that keep you up worrying. But what comfort is found here in David's words, written in the midst of a civil war with some of the mightiest warriors in Israel hunting him? David knew the gruesome horrors of war. Right? He killed tens of thousands. He had had thousands of his closest friends die at his side. His danger was real. No doubt he had men guarding him. No doubt he wisely hid himself. But his confidence wasn't in these things. His shield, his glory, the lifter of his head was Yahweh. I heard from another one in the church this week that stress about their children often keeps them awake at night. For those of you like this one who lie awake at night worried about very real relational troubles, maybe from misbehaving and rebellious children, maybe from friendships gone bad, maybe struggles at work, perhaps your job is in danger. David was in all of that and worse when he wrote this. No matter what tries to keep us awake at night, with anxiety or fear, Sleep should come from the faith-filled recognition that our safety, our shield, our glory, the only one who will lift our head in the morning is God. And then we can say with David, I will not be afraid of thousands of people who have set themselves against me all around or the lesser dangers that keep you and me awake at night. And then by grace, with a thanksgiving-fueled peace that surpasses all understanding, May we express our faith in our trustworthy God by lying down and sleeping. And then when you wake up, don't just go about your day. Don't let brushing your teeth or going to the bathroom be the first thing that you do. Say, thank you, God. I awoke this morning for you sustained me. Also in sleep, if you find yourself wrestling with jumbled thoughts, fears, anxieties that grow bigger in your mind than they actually are. Not only is trusting God a sweet remedy, the ultimate casting of your anxieties on God's mighty right hand, knowing that he cares for you, but if you find yourself struggling with anxiety, sleep is better than any medication science can offer you for that very problem of inordinate anxieties. I was encouraged, I'm gonna keep it to a minimum, but I was encouraged by many to actually do these asides on some of the things that we know about sleep. Um, there's this part of your brain called the amygdala. It's, it gets activated when you see a snake, when you see a scorpion, or when there's thousands of people with an army all around you. It is the area that startles you into activity. That's a gracious invention from God, the, the amygdala. It, it, amps you up and gets you ready to go. But there's a connection between the amygdala and the prefrontal cortex, the part of your brain that rationally can consider the world around you, tone down those emotions that go crazy. And when we don't sleep, it just takes a night of sleeplessness. And this gets exacerbated by night after night after night of chronic sleeplessness. And you can get it from pulling an all-nighter, Staying, staying awake all night, but, but this, is, this connection between the prefrontal cortex and the amygdala actually is shut down very dramatically when you don't sleep. So it's like the amygdala, that fear zone is like the gas, pouring gas on the fire, stepping on the gas, making your car go, and the prefrontal cortex is the brake. And when you don't sleep, you sever the connection between them. It's like your foot is on the gas and the brake doesn't work. You sleep, you reconnect those things. So not only is sleep a gracious expression of faith in God in your anxiety, but it's a provision by God to actually give you the ability to better give you the power to control those thoughts and to 
actively shepherd your heart to cast those cares on him. The reality is that even in war, even in stressful situations, all people sleep, right? This isn't something that only Christians do. All people must sleep. Sleep will ultimately win. We talked about last week. The need for sleep will overcome even the most amped up, anxious, or sleep-averse person. But only Christians can glorify God in their sleep by approaching sleep as this expression of faith. That doesn't mean that Christians automatically glorify God in their sleep, but it's an opportunity for us to do so. Don't miss the opportunity. When I give people anesthesia, they trust me to render them helpless, to sustain their life functions and keep them safe while they're completely incapacitated. And they trust me to wake them up again. To trust me with such a task is understandably nerve-wracking. I'll do my best. I've been trained for this. I'm pretty good at it, but I am not perfect. I make mistakes, and I can't ultimately determine whether you will wake up again. I am not God, but God is God, and he does not sleep or slumber, even while we do. God does not make mistakes. So trust this perfect God, this good God to sustain your life and affairs and indeed the world while you sleep. He is trustworthy. You will not overestimate his trustworthiness. Trust this perfect and good God to sustain your life and affairs and indeed this world while you sleep. That should not be nerve-wracking. That should be peaceful, sleep-inducing. When you awake sweet and refreshed, give God thanks for this good gift that is to be embraced and enjoyed by faith every single night. So let's now turn our eyes to another well-known psalm. Psalm 139, written by David also. This is one that maybe you didn't know had a connection to sleep. It's a little less obvious. But it is powerful. This is perhaps, this psalm, Psalm 139, is perhaps the most clear and thorough treatment of God's omniscience in the entire Bible. God knows every single thing. And he doesn't just know things like we know things, right? We know things like they're facts to be observed, uh, they're items to be understood and then remembered. No, God knows all things before they happen. And he knows them not as an observer, but the sovereign ordainer of all things. And David, the psalmist in whom the psalmist who in times of turmoil and fear so clearly connected sleep to trust in God, here again ties in his, meditation, his meditations of God to their implications on his own sleep. Remember, sleep is an opportunity for the righteous to humbly and dependently trust God. But I think in order to understand the connection to sleep that you have in Psalm 139, we have to look at the psalm as a whole before we can truly appreciate the part, the, its parts. So the key word in this psalm is know, like knowledge, namely the all-knowing omniscience of David's ever-present, all-powerful, wonderfully good God. Look for, those, look for that word as we read Psalm 139, verse 1 through 4, as we're going to work our way through that psalm. O Yahweh, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down, when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my path and my lying down, and you are acquainted. You know all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, 
Behold, O Yahweh, you know it altogether. God knows everything David does when he sits down, when he gets up. He even knows the thoughts that underlie those actions. You discern my thoughts from afar. Verse 3, God knows every action that David does while he's awake. You search out my path. And he knows when and where and why David sleeps in my lying down. Every word before it is spoken, God knows it completely. And both what is said and the intention behind those words. God knows David and he knows you and me. God knows our most inner selves. God knows our hearts. That's a terrifying thought for those in rebellion against God. And David alludes to this in verse 19, praying that God would slay the wicked in his all-knowing power. But David starts this chapter by declaring that God knows him, and he ends it by praying that God would search him and know his heart and his thoughts, leading him in the way everlasting, in ways that endure in the way that will glorify God with works of eternal significance, like the gold, silver, and precious stones, not the wood, hay, and straw that Paul speaks of in 1 Corinthians 3. But before we go on, let me just make the implication obvious for you and for me. God knows our hearts. In Genesis, before the flood, after the fall, when God looked at humanity's hearts, he declared Every intention of the thoughts of man's heart was only evil continually. And the flood did not fix the heart problem, right? So how on earth could God, knowing our hearts, provide us any comfort? Provide David any comfort? Well, for those still living with the hearts you were born with, with unregenerate hearts, unmixed in their rebellion against God, the opening verses, and indeed all of Psalm 139, should be terrifying. But for those who have turned to the Lord in faith, you and I, along with the forgiveness of our sins, past, present, and future, you've received new hearts. These hearts are not yet perfect. We are living in a mixed condition. But for the first time, you can actually glorify God from the heart. You can Obey God from the heart. As Paul says in Romans six seventeen. thanks be to God that you who were once slaves to sin have become obedient from the heart. And speaking of the new covenant with Israel that Gentile Christians get to enjoy as well, God says in Ezekiel 36, 26, I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. God promised Israel that he will give them a heart transplant and that would be their only hope for cleaning. That hasn't happened yet for all of Israel, but it is what happens to us when God saves us. So you know that God knows your heart. And for the Christian, anything good in your heart had to have been created by him. Give him glory for that. Rest confidently when he looks at what he has made in you. But when you look at your own life and you see sin, residual sin, or you look deep into the recesses of your heart and see thoughts that do not honor God, know that God saw them first. So confess them. Agree with God that it's sin and take sweet comfort in the promise of 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And then knowing that God, the omniscient, all-seeing judge, is your Savior who gave his life to save you, to give you a new heart and to cleanse you from unrighteousness, rest. If you are not saved, if you have not turned completely in faith to God to save you, if you are not changed from the heart, if you're just here 
because you thought church was a good place to come. You thought you wanted a little religion in your life. You wanted to add Jesus to your life, but not wholeheartedly turn to him. Then Yahweh's all-knowing omniscience should be of no comfort to you. But for David, the man after God's own heart, and for Christians, there is comfort to be found in this ever-present, all-knowing God, both in our rising up and our lying down. Look at verse 5. You hem me in behind and before and lay your hand upon me. When one is surrounded on all sides by an enemy, it's an inescapable siege. This word is used to describe a siege. But when one is surrounded on all sides by an all-powerful ally, it is an impenetrable hedge of protection. For the one running from God, this hemming in behind and before is like an inescapable siege on a city that will inevitably result in destruction. But for David and for the believer, God has us surrounded as a hedge of protection. As a loving father lays his hand on a fearful child and they fall asleep, we know that no matter what we face, God has our back and our front. He hems us in. Just like David said in Psalm 3 about God, his shield, nothing can get to us without going through him first. And he sees all. This does not mean that everything will go exactly how you want. It will go exactly how God wants. Verse 16 will say, as we get there, that God has foreordained every single one of our days beforehand. In your book, it says, were written every one of the days that were formed for me. Believer, Ephesians 1 promises God chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace. In Romans 8, 28 through 32, worship as we hear this. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. So what shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not graciously give us all things? Is this sovereign, good, omniscient God who, whether we are living our day or asleep at night, hems us in behind and before, laying his hand on us? Psalm 139, verse 6. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. Verse 7 through 16 goes on. There's no place where we can go where God is not, where the all-knowing God does not see. Heaven, he's there. Death or Sheol, there. On the farthest reaches of earth, on the other side of the sea, there. No matter where we are, God is there. His enemies cannot run from him, neither will his own ever find themselves away from his all-knowing, all-powerful, all-wise, all-ordaining, always good presence. What about at night in the dark? And if we are honest, it isn't just kids who are afraid of the dark. Though kids, if you're listening and are afraid of the dark, pay special attention to this part. Verse 11, David rhetorically asks, if I say, surely the darkness will cover me and the light about me be as night. 
David spent many nights in the pitch darkness of the Judean countryside, tending sheep while wolves and bears were out there, lions, fighting wars, hiding in caves, running for his life. And as we saw in Psalm 3 and 4, the dark of the night had to be especially fear-inducing time, an opportunity to trust God with sleep. David's little fire couldn't illuminate the dangers that lurked just beyond the borders of its light. And there were many times in his life when he couldn't even start a fire because Saul and his armies were out hunting him. He had to hide in caves. Have you ever been in the dark, when, like when it's really dark? You feel your helplessness. You don't know if you're safe or if you're in danger. I used to teach scuba diving, and we would do this dumb thing where we would jump off the boat in the middle of the pitch dark at night, and you just knew as soon as you hit the water, a squid or a shark or something's going to grab you. Something you do all the time in the day when you can see. At night, all of a sudden, your brain starts imagining dangers that aren't there. Or you realize that you're helpless to even see the danger coming that might be there. The reality is that we are vulnerable in the dark. We are vulnerable while we sleep. That's actually one of the headings under your passage list. You're vulnerable while you sleep, and there's lots of people in the Bible who got killed while they slept. The darkness and sleep makes one easy prey for your enemy. And some people count on the cover of darkness to hide them while they do evil. Consider Micah 2, Psalm 36, 4, Ephesians 5, 8 through 12. But this darkness doesn't faze God. So David declares, even darkness is not dark to you. The night is bright as the day, for darkness is as light with you. When it is darkest and David is most vulnerable, he knows that God sees when it's darkest and people might be tempted to think that God doesn't see, that they can get away with what they're doing, God can see. Andrew, I just, this is for my son. It might be for other kids here who are scared of the dark. It might be for you if you get scared in the dark. When you're scared, remember that this passage, that no matter how dark it is, it is bright as day for God. Like when you drive by one of the midnight construction sites, it's dark, and then all of a sudden you see just an acre lit up, bright as day. That's how the whole world, the whole universe is for God. Nothing can happen to you without going through God first. And if you think you can get away with doing wrong, because mommy and daddy can't see, God knows. And if you think that there's danger out there that you can't see, God sees it first, and it can't get you without going through him. It's not just my seven-year-old son who needs to hear that, but all of us. So think back on your own life. Where in your own life were you in an environment that was darkest? Where in your own life were you most vulnerable? It was the same for David as it was for all of us. And that David goes on and declares that God was wonderfully present at that darkest, most vulnerable time. And that was in your mother's womb. Not a photon of light. Completely vulnerable, dependent, not even yet fully formed. That's where David goes in his heart-shepherding meditation on God and his omniscient power, even in darkness. Psalm 139, 13, For you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are are your works. My soul knows it well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed substance, and your book were written, every one of them, 
Every one of what? The days that were formed for me, when as yet there was none of them. Every moment of your life, from embryo to cadaver, is seen by God, ordained by God. Every single day, every one of them was written before one of them even existed. Should lead us to the same praise as we have in David in verse 17. How precious to me are your thoughts, O God. How vast is the sum of them. If I would count them, they are more than the sand. I awake, and I'm still with you. When did David fall asleep? What, what, is, what is this? When I awake, I'm still with you. Thinking on this, I'm pretty sure that this is a meditation for David in the night. David, who has a robust theology of sleep that we've seen come out in other chapters, other Psalms, and he views his sleep as an expression of faith and trust in the all-knowing God who never sleeps, the all-seeing God who never sleeps. So instead of counting sheep, David fell asleep in the darkness, meditating on counting the precious, more numerous than sand thoughts that God had served for David. God's, chose, or God's chosen one as a shield of protection. Do you see how the sweet psalm of God's omniscient sovereignty over our life has such a vital connection to our sleep and our waking, whether we are asleep or awake, you're still with me. The Bible is consistent that we ought to worshipfully meditate upon God through all of life. But our bed in the quiet, vulnerable darkness is a particularly precious time to do so, especially when sleep isn't coming easily. I'm going to read just some of the encouragements to do so. Psalm 16, 17. I bless Yahweh who gives me counsel. In the night, also my heart instructs me. Psalm 42, 8. By day, Yahweh commands his steadfast love, and at night, his song is with me, a prayer to the God of my life. Psalm 63, 5 through 6. My soul will be satisfied when I remember you upon my bed and meditate on you in the watches of the night. Psalm 77, 6, when the psalmist cannot sleep, when he is so troubled that he feels that his eyelids are being held open by God, it says. The psalmist says, let me remember my song in the night. Let me meditate in my heart. And then in his sleeplessness, he goes on to meditate upon the wondrous works and shepherd-like care of his God. Psalm 119, verse 55 I remember your name in the night, O Yahweh, and keep your law. Psalm 149, verse 5, let the, go the godly exult in glory. Let them sing for joy on their beds. It is right to meditate on God before you sleep in order to glorify God in your sleep. And if there was ever a reason to wake from your sleep, it would likewise be to meditate upon God and his words. Psalm 149 verse 148 says, My eyes are awake before the watches of the night that I may meditate upon your promises. In Psalm 119.62, At midnight I rise to praise you. So in the dark while I sleep, not quite as vulnerable and helpless as I was in the womb, but maybe close. I am with this God for whom the darkness is as light. And when I awake, I can declare I am still with you. So tonight, every night when you sleep, I encourage you to approach that sleep confidently meditating on the God and his countless thoughts and knowledge. Meditate on the God who keeps you, who lays his hand upon you, who surrounds you, who has ordained every one of your days, your successes, your failures, for his good and your glory. 
And if you are to wake up in the morning, it will have been the Lord. Right, in peace, I will both lie down and sleep. For you, O Yahweh, make me dwell in safety. And when you wake up, declare, I am still with you, for you sustained me. And what if you die while you sleep? What if your body enters the temporary physical state of death that the Bible consistently refers to as sleep? Well, you can confidently trust that you lived every day that was ordained for you just as they were ordained. And the declaration of Psalm 119, 18b will still be just as true as you pass into glory. I awake, Lord, and I'm still with you. So you and I can get fancy security systems. We can hire watchmen to keep us safe. We can stay awake, anxiously shining the flashlight at every shadow, get up to investigate every sound. But ultimately, in the wise words of Jesus, Which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? Instead, we ought to say, as James wisely instructed, if the Lord wills, we will live. Unless the Lord guards the city, the watchmen keep watch in vain. Your late nights, early mornings, if the Lord isn't in it, are vain. And that's where we're going next. That brings us to the last passage of part two of our outline that sleep is an opportunity to humbly, dependently trust God. Turn to Psalm 127. This is a psalm written by Solomon. It's a song of ascent, a song that Jewish pilgrims would sing as they ascended the hill to Jerusalem. This particular psalm focuses on the -the behind-the-scenes activities of God in everyday life. And we ought not be surprised that when thinking about everyday life, sleep, which fills about a third of that life, is front and center. Let's read together Psalm 127. Unless Yahweh builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. Unless Yahweh keeps watch over the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. It is in vain that you rise up early and go late to rest, eating the bread of anxious toil. For he gives to his beloved sleep. This psalm opens with a straightforward declaration that unless the Lord is in what we do, it's in vain. You can see that word vain repeated three times. And if the Lord isn't in what you do, it is in vain. That Hebrew word refers to the concept of futility worthlessness, something that's ultimately inconsequential. What are the things that you do while you're awake? Well, there are things like building a house, protecting your stuff, going to work. And unless the Lord does those things, those who do them will do them in futility, in vain. Any building, no matter how substantial it appears, is meaningless and ultimately exceptionally temporary unless Yahweh builds it. How does Yahweh build a house? This doesn't mean and cannot mean that he does it apart from people's labor. The laborers are obviously the ones putting the bricks one on top of another. another. The watchmen are the ones who are staying up, going about their job, keeping watch. Certainly does not mean that we are not to build and not to watch or guard a city. This is no encouragement to not work. Christians who fear God ought to work and ought to work diligently. The plans of the diligent surely lead to abundance, Proverbs 21.4. And Proverbs 10.4 warns, A slack hand causes poverty, but the hand of the diligent makes rich. And if you do not have a house because you didn't build one, If you are poor because you didn't work or your stuff gets stolen because you did not take appropriate precautions, do not blame God. Christians ought to work and Christians ought to be marked by diligent hard work. Speaking to Christian slaves, Paul writes in Colossians 3.23, Whatever you do, work heartily for the Lord, not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. And generally to all Christians in Colossians 3.17, whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. 
Paul sternly warns the Thessalonians to keep away from any brother who's walking in idleness, and he commends an imitation of his hard work. With toil and labor, we worked all night and day. We worked night and day. In 2 Thessalonians 3.12, we command and encourage in the Lord Jesus Christ to do your work quietly and earn their own living. Psalm 127 is not an encouragement to idleness and laziness, but it is a sweet reminder that while we work diligently, we are working along with the Lord as if unto the Lord when we work in what the Lord would have us do. When God's own work when God's own work diligently for him, and then we look back at what we have accomplished, we see that it was ultimately God working behind the scenes to make our work eternally valuable, something that will survive the refining fire of judgment and redound for his glory. That's what you want to be working for. And simple, everyday things can actually be those things when we do them for him, with him, for his glory, not as distractions from seeking first the kingdom of God, but actually as part of of that and living the life that he has given us to live on this earth. Only the Christian can have the Lord build a house while he builds. And our successes and our protection are ultimately from the Lord when we watch the city. Unless the Lord is in the work, it will be futile. We will not be able to accomplish the work here if the Lord is against it. And even if we do so, it is ultimately in vain, just as Ecclesiastes makes so obvious to us. I've included many of those passages in your passage list. Psalm 127 clearly declares, it is in vain that you rise early and go late to rest if you are eating the bread of anxious toil. Don't you know that God who ordained each one of your days will provide for your needs? He will not do this apart from your hard work, but he will do it in your hard work. And that should change the way you work. And it should change the way you rest, the way you sleep, how much work you take on, how you prioritize that work, the schedule that you apply to your work. In Proverbs 10.3, in the context of warning against being lazy, but also commending righteousness, it says, Yahweh does not let the righteous go hungry. This psalm talks about food that comes from anxious work and shelter that comes from anxious work. That anxiety only robs you from sleep, ends in worthless outcome anyway, if the Lord isn't in the work. And in this context, Jesus' words are so comforting for the believer. He says, therefore, do not be anxious, saying... What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles, those who don't know God, seek after all these things, right? And your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and then all these things, all the things you need will be added to you. The same God that will provide for you as you work is the God who designed you to need about eight hours of sleep every night. He has ordained the good works for your life, and he has set the boundaries within which you get to accomplish those. If you or I find ourselves constantly rising early and going to bed late, especially functioning out of anxious toil, the anxiety that there's so much to do, it's likely a sign that much of the bread that we're eating is from anxious toil rather, rather than that that comes from steadfast trust in God. We're going to go into this more next week when we talk about how the sinful heart can abuse or find opportunity to sin in the gift of sleep, both by abusing it in laziness and avoiding it in anxiety. For as the end of Psalm 127 too declares, he gives to his beloved sleep. Sleep is a good gift from God. You and I were not designed to stay up late and wake up early constantly in order to work. 
Rather, as we work, when we work, we do so diligently unto the Lord. And when we sleep, we sleep knowing that it's a gift from God, not an unnecessary, inconvenient interruption to all that God has for us to do. Only Christians can work knowing that it's God behind the scenes that keeps the work from being in vain. And only Christians can fully receive the gift of sleep as intended for God's beloved. Because it's only for Christians, it's only for God's beloved that God will work as we sleep. So reorient the way that you work. Receive this good gift of sleep. Sleep is not an interruption to what really matters. Our sleep ought to be a restful, sweet expression of dependent faith in God's provision. I'm going to close with Spurgeon's words on this passage. He said, sleep is the gift of God. We think that we lay our heads upon our pillows and compose our bodies in peaceful posture and that therefore we naturally and necessarily sleep. But it's not so. Sleep is the gift of God. Not a man would close his eyes did not God put his fingers on his eyelids. Did not the Almighty send a soft and balmy influence over his frame, which lulled his thoughts into quiescence, making him enter into that blissful state of rest that we call sleep. True, there may be some drugs and narcotics whereby men can poison themselves well nigh to death and then call it sleep. As an aside, those things tend to not induce sleep, just a state of unconsciousness that mimics sleep to an outsider but robs you of most of its benefit. But the sleep of a healthy body is the gift of God. He bestows it. He rocks the cradle for us every night. He draws the curtain of darkness, and he bids the sun shut up its burning eyes, and then he comes and says, Sleep, sleep, my child. I give thee sleep. Let's pray. And I'm going to use the prayer of, uh, it comes from the book, Piercing Heaven, Prayers of the Puritans. Uh, Puritans were people who thought long and hard about simple everyday things like sleep. And I'll pray the prayer from that book as we close and then go out and fellowship for a few minutes before we come back in. Refresh me tonight, Lord. Set apart to me this night's rest. Lord, that I may enjoy your sweet blessing and benefit. With this refreshing sleep, enable me to walk before you, doing the good works that you have appointed. And while I sleep, you who are the keeper of Israel, who neither slumber nor sleep, watch over me in your holy providence. Protect me from all dangers, so that neither the evil angels of Satan nor any wicked enemy may have power to do me harm knowing that your name is a strong tower of defense to all who trust in you. I commit myself and all who belong to me to your holy protection and custody. And if it's your will to call me in my sleep, Lord, have mercy upon me and receive my soul into your heavenly kingdom. Perfect me in every day that good work which you have begun to the glory of your name and the salvation of my sinful soul. Amen.